Hey guys, welcome to episode 7 of Fatal. I'm your host, Beth McCarty. I wanted to take a second just to apologize for the delay in getting this episode out. I have been having some personal issues and I'm trying my best to get through them, so I just want to thank you all for your patience and understanding. Don't forget to check out the website, which links to my Podbean page, fatalpodcast.com. And you can also become a supporter of Fatal for as low as $1 per month and includes a gift for your patronage. So check out the page at patreon.com slash fatal podcast. Now, on to the episode. The morning of August 6, 2003 began like any other morning for 43-year-old Chris McGowan. Chris was a nice, reserved, middle-class Irishman and he was enjoying the best days of his life. That morning, he woke up at 6 a.m. to the sound of his alarm, and after giving himself a few moments to wake up completely, he got up, showered, shaved, dressed in a pair of dockers and a polo, and kissed his half-sleeping fiancée, Jean Domenico, on the cheek. He told her that he would see her at work later. He had a quick breakfast and read the morning paper downstairs before heading out the door and locking it behind him. Outside, Chris took a deep breath of the fresh air in Nashua, New Hampshire. He loved the peacefulness of the New England town that he had called home for the better part of his life. From Jean Domenico's house on Dumaine Avenue, it was a short 20-minute commute to work at Oxford Health Plans on Central Park Drive and Hookset. Both Chris and Jean worked for the same company, and she would be in in about an hour. Uh, They both worked on group contracts for the Benefits, Brokers, and Administration Department. Jean was the mother of two teenagers. She left later for work because it was important for her to make sure the kids had everything they needed and a plan for the day as far as food, rides to friends, uh, soccer and baseball practice, things like that, before she left for the day. She knew that she couldn't keep constant tabs on them during summer break, but she could make sure that they understood she cared about where they went and, you know, what was going on while she was at work. So, Jean was preparing to celebrate her 44th birthday on August 29th in 2003. Chris didn't have anything special planned for his fiance, other than uh, drinks, dinner, and Jean's kids and friends around her. That's just the way she would want it. So, Jean and Chris had started dating back in 2000. And staying the night at Jean's house during the work week wasn't something that Chris would always do. He wasn't real fond of it. Uh, the house could get kind of chaotic and cramped at times. It was your standard New England Cape Cod style house. It had two small bedrooms downstairs, uh, a small eat-in kitchen, one bathroom, and a bedroom upstairs for Jean's daughter, Nicole. Uh, the bedroom had been, been converted from the attic. Chris said that he didn't sleep over a lot during the week because there really wasn't a lot of room for teena- two teenagers getting ready, along with Jean and himself. Chris and Jean had met at work. Uh, Jean, who worked two part-time jobs on top of her full-time job at Oxford, had been with the company for years. Both of them were assigned to the same department and started training on the same day. Jean had divorced Anthony Kaczynskis in 1999, and since then, her main focus had been their two children, 15-year-old Nicole and 14-year-old Charlie. While Jean was at work, the kids pretty much had run of the house. Jean worried about them like any parent would, but she trusted that they would make the right decisions. Chris McGowan lived by himself in a three-bedroom ranch a few miles north of Jean DeMonico's house. On most weekends, he would stay overnight with Jean, but he liked to give her and the kids time and space to spend together during the week. On the week of August 6, 2003, it was even more crowded at Jean's cozy little house because Jean's daughter, Nicole Kaczynskis, had her boyfriend, William Sullivan Jr., who went by Billy, staying at the Domain Avenue house as well. Billy had turned 18 that March, and he had just finished his junior year at Wyndham High School, and he later admitted that he immediately began supporting his mother and four sisters. They all lived together two hours south of Nashua in Willimantic, Connecticut. Billy took a line cook manager's position at a Willimantic McDonald's, He and Nicole had been seeing each other since May of 2002. They met because Billy had sent Nicole a random instant message one night while he and Nicole, 14 at the time, were online. Within days, they had fallen in love. 
After a lot of discussion and debate between Jean and Nicole, Jean decided to allow Billy to stay that week in August. He had arrived on Friday, August 1st. Jean had asked Chris to sleep over to help her keep an eye on things. Jean was worried that two teenagers left alone really couldn't be trusted. It wasn't that Jean thought that Billy was a bad kid or that he had the wrong intentions, but with a teenage girl and an 18-year-old young man under the same roof, left unsupervised, anything was possible. So she enlisted Chris's help to help keep an eye on them. She didn't think that Nicole would do anything like that, but she just wanted to be sure. Chris told Jean not to be so naive. Nicole was 16 and Billy was 18. Nicole was a pretty girl and they would be home alone all day together while he and Jean were at work. What did she think that they would be doing? Jean was pretty much in denial though, telling Chris that it wasn't going to happen, that she knew Nicole. In any case, Billy and Nicole were not allowed in Nicole's room alone together, at least while Chris and Jean were home. Chris had taken on a sort of father figure role since he and Jean had gotten engaged. He had become closer to Nicole and Charlie as his relationship with Jean also grew closer. So Chris kind of kept peace among everyone and dealt with certain situations that Jean had little tolerance for. As Chris had suspected, it was much too late to stop the progress of Billy and Nicole's relationship. Over the last 15 months, they had built an incredible bond, despite the distance between them. This had caused tension between Nicole and Jean, and by the third day of Billy being there, Jean had explained to both kids that Billy needed to go back to Connecticut, and he was scheduled to that Thursday, August 7th. She had also told Chris and Nicole that she wasn't thrilled with the thought of Billy returning anytime soon. You see, Jean wanted Nicole to focus on being a teenager, uh, going out with friends, getting back into the chorus at school. She had always loved the chorus until Billy came along. And Jean and Chris were worried that she was going to waste her potential or life getting wrapped up in this heated love affair at such a young age. Billy had actually written Jean a letter that she received recently. And it had said something like, First of all, I'd like to thank you for giving birth to the most amazing and beautiful girl in the world. He said that he loved Nicole with all of his heart, and he had every intention of spending his life with her, that he would love her and treat her with all the respect in the world. He had also mentioned that he and Nicole had been talking about moving to Connecticut and living with his mother and sisters. Nicole could transfer schools and it would all work out, Billy promised. He wanted Jean's support and blessing. About six months after Billy and Nicole had first met, uh, Nicole was 15 then, Nicole wrote Jean a similar letter explaining her feelings for Billy. Uh, Nicole said that she had discussed the situation with Billy and agreed that it was time for her to legally be emancipated from Jean. Uh, she said, Mom, I want to move in with Billy. I'm really not happy here. Billy is the only person who makes me happy. I'm sick of this house, family, and I don't want to live here anymore. This wasn't the Nicole that Jean, Chris, or even her little brother Charlie knew. They thought that she was surely being influenced or even controlled by Billy. Nicole said that Jean became very angry and started screaming when she got that letter. And weeks later, Nicole mentioned that she was thinking of opening a joint checking account with Billy in Connecticut. Nicole said that Jean replied, and I quote, Haven't I taught you anything? In a rage. Nicole just walked away. She thought that her mom just didn't understand her, as most of us did as teenagers. Jean told Nicole that Billy was going back to Connecticut for good, and that Nicole wasn't going to be allowed to see him for a while. It was time to either end the relationship or at least allow a cooling off period. And Jean told Chris that she just wanted her daughter back. While Chris and Jean were at work on August 6th, they didn't get to talk much aside from a quick passing hello. And Chris tried to stop by Jean's cubicle just to chit chat a few times throughout the day. It wasn't that they didn't want to talk. They just had kind of decided from the start of their relationship that they were going to try to keep their personal and business relationship separate. At the end of Chris's day, around 4.30, he walked over to Jean's desk just to touch base before he left. Uh, they had already talked about Chris going to his house after work. He was going to grab a quick shower and then meet Jean back at her place between 7 and 7.30. Jean had mentioned something about picking up dinner on the way home. There was a pizza place near the house that Jean loved, 
and they were running a special that day. So Chris poked his head in her cubicle just to confirm that he would see her at her place, and she told him that she had called the kids and that she was going to go ahead and pick up that pizza on her way home. Uh, After Chris made sure that he didn't need to pick anything up, he told her that he loved her, she returned the sentiment, and then they hugged goodbye. See, Jean had a routine when she returned home from work around 5.30 every night. She'd usually pick up after whatever mess the kids had left for the day, and then she'd start on other chores. You know, mostly the typical life of a, a single mom. Billy and Nicole left the house on Domain Avenue in Billy's car that day, sometime before Jean left work to pick up the pizza. A neighbor said that she had seen them playing around in the backyard that day around 4 p.m., Uh, They were playing tag or something, and she said that she could hear Nicole calling Billy's name. The neighbor said that they were just being kids. Billy was seen wearing jeans, a t-shirt, and bright white sneakers. Nicole was upset about this being her last night with Billy. He was scheduled to leave for Connecticut the next morning. She had no idea when he was coming back or if she would even be allowed to visit him in Connecticut. From what I've read and the way it's been described, Nicole wasn't unlike most teenage girls. I know that I myself went through the stage where I felt like no one understood me, especially my parents. And I remember thinking that my high school boyfriend was the love of my life and that we were going to be together forever. I also remember feeling as if a part of me was missing when we weren't together. So I can kind of relate to the feelings that Nicole described when she was asked about her relationship with Billy and how they both wondered how they would make it without each other. On the other hand, although they had been a couple for 15 months, they had only seen each other in person four or five times. While they were out driving around that day, Nicole had asked Billy what they were going to do and Billy just looked at her. She and Billy had already discussed running away together to Vermont or Niagara Falls, anywhere really that they could be together. But Nicole wasn't ready to commit to that plan. Somewhere near 5.30 p.m., Chris pulled into his driveway. All I wanted to do was run in, go through his mail real quick, check his email, and then throw a night bag together so he could head out to Jean's. It was about 7 p.m. when Chris was done freshening up and doing all that he wanted to do around the house. Uh, He decided to call Jean first to see if there was anything she needed before he left. He said the phone rang six times and there was no answer. Now, he figured that she might be taking the dog out for a walk or something. It wasn't unusual behavior for Jean not to answer her phone. She wasn't really one to sit still and she liked to keep herself busy. She didn't sit around all day waiting for the phone to ring. Uh, Charlie was at a friend's house and according to a note left on the kitchen counter... Billy and Nicole were at Lita Lane's, a local bowling alley, playing pool. The note also said that they might go to Brusters, uh, a nearby ice cream shop. Billy had wrote and signed the note for both of them. It was pretty typical for Nicole to leave a note to let Jean know where she was going. Chris finished up checking his email and tried to call Jean one more time before leaving. It was just a few minutes after 7. He still didn't get an answer. Chris was starting to think she was probably just busy cleaning up. He didn't think it was a big deal. He went out to his car and picked up his cell phone that he'd left in the front seat. The time on the phone read 7.15 p.m. There was no message from Jean, but there was a missed call showing Billy's number. Nicole had called him five minutes before, at 7.10. There was a voicemail, so Chris checked it, and it was Nicole. She said, Chris, I was unable to reach anyone at home, I just tried calling the house. My mom's not home yet. It's getting late. I figured she would be with you. Just wanted to let you guys know me and Billy will be late for dinner. Chris said she was calm and he could hear Billy in the background telling Nicole to let Chris know where they'd be and how long they'd be out. Give him my number, Chris could hear Billy say. Then Nicole spoke again. It's getting kind of late, so we were just wondering if she was with you. We really don't know when we'll be back. Call us on Billy's cell phone if you need me. Listening to Nicole's voicemail didn't really affect Chris one way or the other. It was usual practice for Nicole to check in with her mom, and she had said that she couldn't reach Jean either, so he didn't really think twice about it. Before pulling out of his driveway, he saved the voicemail message and tried to call Jean one more time, thinking she may want a bottle of wine or something. Once again, no answer. 
Chris stopped at a 7-Eleven that was right behind Jean's house to get a bottle of soda. More out of habit than anything else, he checked his phone again to see if Jean had called. She hadn't. From the parking lot, he could see Jean's car parked in her driveway, so she was definitely home. Nicole and Billy hadn't stayed at the bowling alley long, and they only spent a few minutes at the ice cream shop. At intervals between 6 and 7 p.m., they sat in the 7-Eleven parking lot across from Nicole's house, wondering how they were going to convince Jean that Billy wasn't going to leave for New Hampshire alone. They were two kids desperate to be together. They were asking themselves why no one understood them, and why couldn't people just see that theirs was not just some fleeting high school romance. Nicole couldn't just stand at the end of her driveway and wave to Billy as he left, not knowing if she was ever going to get to see him again. Jean adored Nicole and only wanted the best for her. It was never about Billy, his attitude, behavior, or goals in life. What Jean was worried about was the two years of high school that Nicole still had ahead of her. She was going to finish them, and she didn't need any complications from this boy or any boy. Nicole was torn about what to do. She wanted to confront her mother one more time, wanting to plead with her and ask her why she couldn't try to understand. Thinking of Billy leaving now was reminding her of leaving after the first time they had met. It had been August 2002, and Nicole had talked Jean into taking her to Connecticut to see Billy after they had been talking online and the phone for two months. Jean agreed after much pleading and begging, but she was going to chaperone the eight-hour visit. Nicole knew that day that Billy was the one. She was hopeless when they pulled out of Billy's driveway. She cried the entire two hours home, and she didn't know what to do with herself. As they sat in the parking lot at 7-Eleven, Billy said at one point that if he had to drive back home to Connecticut without her, that he would steer his car into an oncoming truck. Nicole just stared out of the window and cried. She couldn't even think of losing Billy that way. When Chris pulled up in the driveway at Jean's house, he noticed the family Shih Tzu Buster was out in the backyard on his leash. Jean had probably put him outside on the leash so he could do his thing. The pup was kenneled up most of the day in the house, so putting him outside on the leash was one of those habitual things that Jean did every day. Uh, Jean also had a husky named Princess with a doghouse out back. Princess was also there, walking circles and barking a welcome to him. Chris walked up to the house and noticed that there were no lights on in the house. When he reached the door, he also noticed it was slightly ajar. He said it looked like no one was home. So he pushed the door open and yelled for Jean. Chris didn't notice it right away, but the coffee table in the living room was smashed into bits and pieces. The kitchen was a wreck. In fact, there were things out of place all over. It looked as if there had been some sort of struggle. As Chris made his way into the kitchen, he realized that even though the lights were off, there was a little sliver of light coming from the refrigerator door because it was slightly ajar. Chris called for Jean again, and he continued further into the kitchen. He saw her legs first. She was on the floor, lying face down. Chris immediately knelt down by her side, calling her name. When she didn't answer, he began shaking her. Now, at this time, he didn't know if she had fallen and hit her head, passed out, or what exactly had been happening. Apparently, lately, she had been complaining, uh, just over the last few days anyway, of feeling kind of off and not like herself. She had even called her doctor about it on August 4th because she felt just kind of tipsy or dizzy and fatigued. As Chris was shaking her, trying to get her to respond, he noticed a large pool of blood underneath Jean's head and upper body. He said it was still tacky and somewhat wet. What Chris didn't realize was that there was blood splattered from one end of the kitchen to the other. With the light off, he didn't see it on the refrigerator, cabinets, door jam, table, chairs, and floor. Even the carpet in the living room had patches of blood, and there were droplets leading up the stairs. The moment Chris noticed the blood, he reached for the telephone. By now, he was a wreck. He was shaking, stuttering, and mumbling to himself. He was shaking so hard he had trouble even dialing 911. But he did dial 911, and he explained that his girlfriend was there and that she was laying in a pool of blood. 
The dispatcher confirmed the address and asked if he knew what happened. He said no, that he had just walked in the door. Uh, and then the dispatcher asked if Jean was breathing or conscious, and he said he didn't know. She wasn't moving. He did try to lean down to her and said that he didn't believe she was breathing. Chris asked the dispatcher if he could turn the TV off in the living room because it was so loud. He kept repeating that he didn't know what she had hit her head on, but there was stuff all over. The dispatcher dialed a police officer that was in a nearby area of the house. Uh, the dispatcher then asked if there was a portable phone that he could use so he could walk out of the house. So Chris switched phones real quick as he was told to, and then the dispatcher told him to try to back out of the room and not touch anything. The dispatcher then started asking Chris some routine questions, just trying to get some information and, and as much as they could. Um, like, you don't know how long she's been there, and Chris said that he didn't, and you think it was uh, her head, that she hit her head, and Chris admitted that he really didn't know. Uh, they then had a short conversation about the last time that Chris had seen Jean, what time it was, and where. Uh, the dispatcher also asked Chris if he wanted to wait on the phone with them or wait outside. They continued the conversation. Uh, Chris asked if, if they were on their way. Uh, the dispatcher assured him that they were. And then he had a moment where he said, oh my God. He put the phone down, went back to Jean, knelt beside her. And he placed his right hand behind her back and picked her neck and head up off the ground. He thought to himself uh, that she was cold. He whispered that he loved her in her ear. He picked the phone back up and the dispatcher told him that he could go when he heard the sirens. Chris told the dispatcher that he didn't see anything, but he could hear them now. He w bent down to look at Jean one last time, and it was only then that he noticed he said an image that would be with him for the rest of his life. Jean was staring at him. Her eyes were wide open, glossy, and blank. He said that it was then he knew that she was gone. Nashua police officer Kurt Gauthier was about one mile away in his cruiser when he responded to the report of a sudden death. He flicked on his lights and rushed towards Domain Avenue. He arrived three minutes later, and Chris was waiting at the door. Officer Gautier said that Chris appeared desperate and perplexed. Uh, Gautier didn't know what to expect when he entered the house. All of the information he really had was that a man had reported a woman on the floor of her home who was not responding, and she had a pool of blood around her. I checked for signs of life. There were none. She was cold, waxy. It was clear to me that she had died a violent death. She was covered in an enormous amount of blood. It was still wet and shiny. There was a tremendous amount of blood throughout the entire kitchen. There was uh, blood smears and splatter all over the, the walls, the cabinets, the refrigerator. Inside the kitchen sink, I found some bloodied and broken portions of uh, what appeared to be a small steak knife. Not long after his arrival, several more officers arrived, as well as EMTs and firefighters. Gautier said later in court that it was a bloody mess. There was blood all over the floor, all over the cabinetry. It was everywhere. He saw massive amounts splattered on the walls. The blood was still wet. It hadn't dried. This gave him the idea, as he was surveying the scene, that the crime perhaps had just taken place. Chris was escorted away from the house and questioned. Gautier had questioned Chris after first arriving at the scene, but said that it was hard to get any information out of him because he was such a mess. About this time, Jean's neighbor, Donna Shepard, was looking out her porch window. Uh, she noticed two figures on the side of Jean's house. She couldn't really make out who it was, but she thought that it was Chris and Jean. She had wanted to talk to Jean about something uh, she had found out about Nicole the previous day. Jean and Donna were good friends. Uh, they had been neighbors for the past two years, and Donna had three young kids. And Nicole had recently started babysitting Donna's children. Through that, Donna and Nicole had become close as well. 
At times, Nicole would confide in Donna about teenage problems that, you know, she felt like she couldn't talk to her mom about. And actually, the previous day, Nicole had come over to babysit, and she seemed really worried about something. When Donna asked her what was bothering her, Nicole asked if she would go to the store and get her a pregnancy test. Nicole begged her not to tell Jean, and Donna said that she wouldn't, but she kind of knew that she had to. Donna did go to the store and pick up a pregnancy test and brought it back to the house while Nicole waited. Nicole took the test while Donna was there, and now Donna wanted to go tell Jean what she knew and the results of the test. When Donna rounded the house, she noticed all of the police cars and that they were starting to surround the house with crime scene tape. She saw Chris and that it wasn't Jean that he was standing next to, but a police officer. So she approached him and asked him what was going on. Chris babbled to himself mostly and dropped to his knees and started crying. Then he would get up and walk in circles. At one point, Donna said she heard Chris shout, Why? Why did someone do this to Jean? Why did this happen? Donna said when she heard that, she shut down. She was told that she needed to leave and that someone would be over to speak with her soon. So that's exactly what she did. Another one of the neighbors near Jean's house was attempting to come home, and the police had the street blocked off. Carla Hall parked on the side of the street and approached a police officer. He told her that she couldn't come in and that it didn't matter that she lived there. Carla immediately called Donna, and Donna told her what was going on. Carla said she was in complete shock. When she got off the phone with Donna, she went to the police officer again, and she told him that she knew what was going on and she wanted in her house. After a while and some talking with the other officers, she was able to get into the house. Once inside, she couldn't help but think of Jean and why anyone would want to do this to her. She was the kind of person that just made everyone's day better, Carla said. And Carla's mind instantly went to Nicole and Charlie. Where were they? Were they in the house? Nicole was probably with her boyfriend, spending their last night together. Carla knew that Billy was scheduled to head home the following day. She was really worried about how Nicole would take it, as she had been prone to depression before. As with most crimes of this nature, the first initial suspect is usually the significant other. So Chris needed to be questioned. Even if he wasn't involved, he may know something important to the case without even realizing it. At the crime scene, detectives could tell that he was not in the best frame of mind, though. Chris recalled that everything was moving so fast and he was stumbling through his words, just really not knowing what was going on. Neighbors were gathered in the street and talking as police came and went. Domain Avenue was heavily trafficked with crime scene trucks and evidence vans. Officers were going door to door asking questions and taking statements. Jean's ex-husband became a popular topic of conversation. It was known that Anthony Kaczynskis had been in trouble with the law before. It was also noted during the questioning of the neighbors that Jean was terrified of her ex. She would sometimes call the neighbors and have them go check in with the kids while they were home by themselves. She was worried about Anthony. I guess he would sometimes show up unannounced. Uh, she did start to relax more when Chris started staying overnight with her. As the officers made their way around the neighborhood asking questions, they finally reached Donna's house. She and Carla were sitting together, and the officers asked if either of them had seen anything off or peculiar that day. Both women said that they hadn't, and Donna even said that she had cut through Jean's yard somewhere between 6 and 6.30, like she always did, to go pick up one of her kids from the daycare facility that was adjacent to Jean's house. Donna said she hadn't seen anything on her way through. Donna was asked to come to the station to answer a few questions, and she agreed that she would. She made sure that the kids were taken care of and then she left with an officer. The crowd had really started to gather now. Uniformed officers, bystanders, detectives, medics. There were people everywhere. The officer led Donna through the crowd and as they walked, she saw Charlie emerge. Charlie asked Donna what was going on and she didn't answer him. And he was like, Donna, where's my mom? I want to see my mom. And Donna said all she could do was look at the ground. She started to say something, but she said just as she was about to speak, the officer ducked her into a police cruiser and shut the door. The pregnancy test that Nicole had taken at Donna's had been negative, and she had seemed to be really relieved. Nicole and Donna had an open relationship, and Nicole knew that she could talk to Donna about anything, 
But Donna had never told her that she would keep her mother out of the loop. She thought that Jean should know that Nicole was sexually active. Jean was already worried about the relationship moving too fast and Nicole becoming so dependent on Billy for her happiness. Nicole had brought Billy over to meet Donna and Donna's kids. Uh, Donna saw Billy as a clean-cut kid. He was very quiet, friendly, polite, nice. Chris was sewing through a roller coaster of emotions as the night wore on. But as 9 p.m. approached, he was getting frustrated. He knew that Jean was gone, but no one had told him how she died. Reliving the scene over and over in his head, the only thing Chris could think was that she must have fallen and hit her head. It was really the only logical explanation to him. The entire time there, there was always an officer shadowing Chris. Finally, an officer approached Chris and told him that he needed to go down to the station so they could question him further. Chris agreed and followed the officer. Along the way to the car, the officer asked Chris some questions, like who was Jean? How did Chris know her? Then Chris heard the detective say to a colleague, she's here. Chris didn't know who they were talking about. Uh, the detectives were kind of talking amongst themselves. Just, you know, great, she's here already. So Chris asked, what do you mean? Who's here? And the detective gestured with his head in the direction of the woman holding a notepad and making her way toward them. The woman was a reporter from a local newspaper. Its front page focus was primarily on crime. The detectives hurried Chris into the front seat of the cruiser. He sat by himself there for about 15 minutes before he finally got out. He saw Donna. She was back from questioning now. They hugged and he asked an officer if he could go use her bathroom. That it was getting urgent. The officer told him that he could go around back, but Chris was not to leave his sight. Chris didn't realize at the time that every move he made was being monitored. He said that he never felt like he was being treated differently at least no differently than anybody else that was on scene. Patricia, or Pat Sullivan, was at her Willimantic, Connecticut home when she received a call from Billy, her son. It was about 7.30 p.m. Pat said later that he was calm, and he explained that he and Nicole had been driving around most of the night. Uh, they'd been shopping, and he said they were at the mall, and he was picking out souvenirs for his sister's. Pat told him not to be spending all of his money. She asked him if he was remembering to take his medication. Billy was on a cocktail of antidepressants. He took the pills at night. It was important that he took them or things fell apart rather quickly. And Billy told her that he had been taking them. As the murder scene back at Jean's unfolded, Billy and Nicole drove around town. Unless they were stalking the scene from afar, they couldn't have known that cops were scurrying around, collecting evidence, interviewing neighbors and friends trying desperately to find out what had happened. Nicole had no idea that her little brother Charlie now knew that Jean was dead, or that Charlie was out there on the front lawn, like everyone else, answering questions, crying, and just trying to comprehend it all. While they were out, Billy did stop at a shopping mall. Nicole bought him a new pair of socks and a t-shirt. For some reason, Billy felt the need to wear them that night, and changed clothes just down the street from Jean's, in the parking lot of the local movie theater. Nicole had called home a few times, but never got an answer. So she left several messages saying that she and Billy were running late and that they would be home as soon as they could. This was their last night together after all, so they had to make the best of it. Nicole had brought up the idea of just running away to Connecticut, but Billy turned her down. He said the cops would be at his door in two days. Then she mentioned Vermont and Niagara Falls because they had discussed it before. And Billy was like, come on, Nicole. After leaving the movie theater parking lot and stopping a few more places, Billy drove to Amanda Kane's house. Now, this isn't her real name. This is a name that was in one of the research books that I read. Amanda was Jean's best friend. She lived about three miles east of Jean's house. Jean, Billy, Nicole, Charlie, and Chris had helped Amanda move into the house the previous Friday. Amanda worked about 45 minutes away, and she woke up at 4 a.m. every morning to get ready for work. She had to be there by 6.30 or 7, so on most nights, she was in bed by 8. At around 10 o'clock that night, Billy and Nicole knocked on Amanda's door. Amanda wasn't quite asleep, but she did have the lights off and she was laying down. She remembered being upset when she opened the door to ask what they wanted. Uh, she knew Nicole was aware of her schedule and 
not to bother her that late. Uh, Nicole said that they wanted to come over just to say goodbye since Billy was leaving the next morning. Amanda said Nicole looked sincere, and Nicole had tried to call Amanda three times earlier that day, but Amanda had screened her calls and not answered. Amanda said she just assumed that Nicole and Billy would go home and leave her alone, but there they were in her doorway. She invited the men, and she said that Billy seemed hyped up and jittery. Nicole was pretty relaxed, calm, but also seemed kind of sad. They both looked tired and exhausted. After some small talk, Amanda told them that they needed to go because she had to get to sleep so she could go to work in the morning. She told Nicole it was late and her mom was probably worried about her. Amanda picked up her phone and tried to call Jeans, but didn't get an answer, so she tried to call Chris. When he didn't answer either, she told Nicole that they were probably out looking for her. Amanda told Nicole that she should just go home. Billy said that they were tired and that's probably what they were going to do is just go back to Jeans so he could crash on the couch. Chris didn't notice all of the blood he was covered in until he was under the harsh fluorescent lights in the small room that the detectives had put him in at the NPD. Both of his arms from his triceps down to his fingertips were covered. His knees, because he was wearing shorts, had patches of blood on them as well from when he knelt down beside Jean. They had left Chris in the room by himself for what seemed like an hour to Chris, but it was actually only about 15 minutes. When one of the detectives came back into the room, he asked Chris when the last time he saw Jean was. Chris explained that he had just seen her at work since they worked for the same company. Uh, they asked, you know, did she say anything to you about meeting anyone tonight? Chris said that she hadn't. He said that he was staying there for this week and Jean was supposed to go pick up a pizza and then go home and meet up with him and the kids. And it was then that he kind of thought about the kids like a light bulb went off. He became suddenly worried. He needed to tell them before they found out some other way. He had no idea how he was going to explain it to Charlie and Nicole. Although Chris, the kids, and the neighbors didn't know, detectives from the MPD CID unit knew as the night moved forward and the investigation progressed that violence was not an intense enough word to explain what had happened inside Jean's kitchen. Jean hadn't fallen and hit her head, as most everyone was thinking and she didn't get into a scuffle with a burglar. Detectives knew immediately upon entering Jean's home that she had been savagely beaten with some sort of blunt, solid object. She was also stabbed repeatedly with at least two different knives. Some early estimates, while evidence was still being gathered, was that she was stabbed 40 to 50 times. She had wounds to her face, neck, head, and throat. She also had what looked to be defensive wounds on her hands. Detectives knew that this wasn't a random act of violence. This was personal and angry. There was a connection there. It appeared that detectives had key pieces of evidence to go on, yet no viable suspect. Then, at 9.13 p.m., while searching Jean's backyard, one of the investigators found something. Chris said he finally figured out that what had happened to Jean was no accident while being questioned by the police. He said there was so much going on, he didn't have time to think about it, but that's why they were asking him so many questions. Something horrible had happened, yeah, but it wasn't an innocent fall. During Chris's questioning, which he viewed as nothing more than a relaxed interview, the kids would come up. Where were Nicole and Charlie? Detectives wanted to know if Chris could reach them or if he knew where they were. Chris said that he didn't, but he needed to find them. He said that Nicole had called him earlier and left a message saying that she and her friend were out doing stuff and he thought that they had went bowling and shopping, but he really had no idea where. Chris explained that Nicole's friend was Billy Sullivan, a boy who she had been dating, and that Billy had been in town all week visiting. He also offered to play back the voicemail that Nicole had left him from earlier that night but then he realized he left a cell phone on the kitchen table at Jean's house. Chris thought that he remembered Billy's number, but couldn't be absolutely sure it was right. The detectives left the room. Chris said it went on like that. The detectives would come in, they'd ask a few questions, and then they'd leave the room, only to return again later, wanting to know more information. Chris was asked about Nicole and Charlie, and Chris said that Nicole was a model student and a model daughter. As far as Charlie goes... Chris couldn't imagine Charlie having anything to do with Jean's death, but he had to admit Charlie was a hothead. 
Chris had replaced a couple of doors because Charlie had put his fist through them after getting pissed off at his mom. It was also mentioned in the interview that Jean was afraid of knives. In fact, until Chris started staying over at her house, she didn't even own any knives. There were times that Charlie would get so angry that Jean didn't want him to have easy access to any weapons. It was only after having a barbecue one evening, when Chris didn't have a knife to cut into his steak, that Jean gave in, and they purchased a decent knife set for the house. Charlie and Jean had not been getting along all that well lately either. Charlie was hanging out with a group of known troublemakers, and sometimes would fight with his mom, and then stay with friends for a couple of days at a time. After Chris answered a few more questions about Charlie, detectives left the room again. Chris was also asked if he would give a DNA sample, and he did. Billy and Nicole arrived at the house somewhere around 10.15 p.m. The scene was still busy with people, crime scene investigators, and detectives, and facts were becoming more clear as the investigation progressed. But everyone was still wondering how a woman like Jean could end up dead on her kitchen floor. Parker Smith, another neighbor of Jean's, saw Billy's car creeping its way up the street. He was driving really slowly, and Nicole's window was down. As Billy moved closer to the house, Parker said several police officers stood in front of the car with their hands up, motioning for Billy to stop. According to Parker, several officers rushed to each side of the vehicle as Nicole and Billy got out of the car. Nicole asked what was going on. The officer asked who they were, and Nicole identified herself. She seemed surprised by everything that was going on and also concerned and worried. Detective Leanham, who had also questioned Chris, noticed that a car with Connecticut plates had pulled up, and he remembered that Chris had said Nicole's boyfriend was from Connecticut. Billy was explaining that Nicole was his girlfriend and that he lived out of state when Leanham approached them. Leanham noticed that Billy was pacing back and forth, and at one point he asked Billy to try and relax. Uh, Billy explained that he took medication for high anxiety and that he really just couldn't stand still. Billy was told that he needed to come down to the station for questioning, and he said that wouldn't be a problem. Nearby, Nicole was being told the same thing. The couple was then separated and moved to the edge of the crime scene. Detective Richard Sprankle was then told to keep the couple separated and to transport them in different vehicles. While waiting to be transported, Billy continued to pace. He said he felt like he was going to be sick, and then he walked to the back of the car and began dry heaving. Billy was transported to the police station, accompanied by Detective Leanham, who shared the back seat with him. As they drove, Leanham asked Billy a few questions, like, how long have you and Nicole been together? And Billy seemed uncomfortable and kind of antsy. He did answer that they'd been together for 15 months, and Lena asked how they had met, like he was just making casual conversation, trying to gain some basic knowledge. And Billy told them that they had met through a mutual friend, which was a lie because they had met online in a chat room. For the next few minutes, they discussed where Billy was from and the town of Willimantic itself. Here within the city of Nashua, we're only dealing with maybe two or three homicides a year. There was a bloody palm print on the refrigerator door. There was the bloody footprints leading from the kitchen to the second floor. There were two knives found outside to the rear of the residence. Detective Sergeant Richard Sprankle walked into the kitchen of Jean's house with Assistant Deputy M.E. Wayne Geronimo. They both noticed the way the blood from one end to the other was spattered. The pattern indicated some kind of struggle between Jean and her killer or killers. Among the blood spatter patterns across the floor and cabinets were several footprints. Jean's was among them. There appeared to be a large bloody palm print on the refrigerator. Heading toward the living room, Sprinkle saw the remains of the coffee table, which had been broken in half. He also noticed the back door glass had been pushed out, apparently from the inside. So Jean's killer had walked into the house without a problem, but for some reason, maybe pushed his or her way out, or struggled with Jean knocking the glass out. Inside the kitchen sink was the handle of a knife. 
The blade was on the floor. And there were two more knives found in the backyard. DeGeronimo examined Jean's body and saw that there were dozens of stab wounds to her neck and throat and even her head. Nothing was missing from the house, so burglary was quickly ruled out. The neighbor, Parker Smith, was inside his house when a cop knocked on his door, asking if he would be willing to take a ride downtown to give a statement. At the station, Parker told detectives exactly what he'd saw that day. Nicole and Billy running around in the backyard playing tag. He was asked if he had recalled what clothes they were wearing. The detectives said they were especially interested in what Billy was wearing, and Parker told them white sneakers, jeans, and a white t-shirt. He didn't even hesitate. Parker laid out the entire layout of the neighborhood as he remembered it throughout the day, where cars were parked, when Nicole and Billy were home, when they left, who was home in the neighborhood during the day, and who wasn't. Chris had sat for hours for questioning, and he was exhausted, feeling a bit confined and ready to leave. He wanted to go see Amanda Kane, Jean's best friend. He knew she would be sleeping, but he wanted to be the one to tell her the news. He didn't want her to hear it from different media accounts. Chris's mom, brother, and sister arrived to pick him up. They had brought him a fresh pair of clothes to change into. Jennifer Hunt was a victim's advocate for New Hampshire. She was introduced to Chris by Detective Leanham. It was her job to be there for Chris, Nicole, Charlie, or anyone else in Jean's family needing emotional support. She would basically walk everyone through the judicial system and explain as best she could what was happening as the investigation proceeded. Hunt informed Chris that Charlie was going to be taken home to his father's house. Chris didn't really know what to think about that. Anthony hadn't stepped up as a parent the entire time Chris knew Jean, but Hart told Chris that this was what Charlie wanted. Chris was not happy about this, and he even felt a bit wounded. Jean wouldn't want it, but Hunt explained to him that Tony was Charlie's legal guardian, and there was really nothing that could be done about it. Chris decided then to get out of there as fast as he could and just go over to Amanda's so he could let her know what had happened. As Chris was leaving the station with his family, he was still in a daze. He walked right past Charlie, who was sitting on the top steps going into the station. It wasn't until he reached the car that he noticed him. Chris walked up to Charlie, and he sat with him and put his arm around him. He tried to comfort him telling him that they were going to be okay, that they were going to get through this. He found that he really didn't know what to say. No matter what the words were, they couldn't change the fact that Jean had been taken from them. Chris asked him if he was going to be okay staying with his father, and Charlie said that he would be. After a few moments of silence, Chris again said that it was going to be okay. And Chris later recalled that Charlie looked up and stared at him in the eyes. And when Chris saw the look in his eyes, he asked him, you know, what's wrong? What is it? He did it, Charlie blurted out. Chris didn't know who he was talking about, and he asked him what he meant. Billy, said Charlie. Chris tried to explain that the police didn't know who did it yet, and what would make Charlie say that? I'm telling you he did it, Charlie said. Chris told him that it wasn't true, but Charlie said again, he did it, and he kept saying his name and shaking his head just repeating the words over and over. Chris told him to forget about that. He hugged him, again telling him that they were going to get through this together. And Charlie just said, I know he did it. Back inside the station, Billy was still in the small interview suite. Billy later said that at no time did Lean In or anyone else explain to him that he didn't have to talk or that he could leave the building whenever he wanted. Billy said that he wanted to get out of there, that he didn't like police stations, and he felt that you could easily get talked into corners. Lena asked Billy if he was okay. Billy was kind of bouncing his leg up and down nervously, but he said he was good. Lena excused himself and said that he would be right back. Lena actually went out to speak with colleagues who had interviewed several of Jean's neighbors and other rooms. The only thing really learned about Billy was where he had been about 4 p.m., where Parker had seen him and Nicole in the backyard. It was a start. Lenham would start from there. When Lenham entered the room, Billy was standing with his back to him. 
He had his cell phone and looked like he was calling someone. Uh, when he heard Lenum come in, though, he quickly put the phone back in his pocket. Lenum started by just asking Billy general questions, uh, asking, you know, what did you and Nicole do today? And he said that he and Nicole had went to Lita Lane's, um, and he laughed that they'd probably stopped at Dunkin' Donuts like 1,200 times. Lenum noticed that Billy had started shaking and looking pale. He was also having a hard time keeping still. For the next 20 minutes or so, Billy and the detective discussed the town Billy was from, his family background, and who lived at the Domenico home on Domain Avenue. Billy was asked when the last time he spoke to Jean Domenico was, and Billy said that Jean had called the house around 2 in the afternoon that day. Uh, Nicole had been in the shower, and Jean wanted to remind Nicole to take the dogs out, and told Billy that she was going to pick up pizza, and that Chris would be coming over to the house. Lena asked where else Billy and Nicole had gone that day, and he said that they had went to, again, Lena Lane's, Dunkin' Donuts, and Pheasant Lane Mall. Billy was still seeming kind of antsy and jumpy, so the detective asked if it would help if they moved into a bigger room. Billy agreed that it probably would, so he said he'd be right back, and he went off to find a larger room. Detective Mark Schaaf was in an interview suite down the hall with Nicole. Since Nicole was a juvenile, Schaaf had to be careful. He read her what was called uh, the Benoit rights, or warnings, which are the juvenile equivalent to Miranda. Nicole didn't have to answer any questions if she didn't want to. She was visibly upset after learning that her mom was seriously injured, is what they told her. She was crying so hard at times it was difficult to understand what she said. And Shafe tried to be comforting as he started his questioning. He asked what she and Billy had done that day. And Nicole started hyperventilating. She tried to speak, but she couldn't. Eventually, she did calm down enough that she was able to talk. She told the detective that she and Billy had went to Walmart and went to see a movie. After she gave the detective a brief account of the day that she'd spent with Billy, Shafe met Lynam in the hallway. The two detectives compared versions of the day as described by Nicole and Billy, and they realized that their stories weren't quite matching up. So Shafe went back in to talk to Nicole. He noticed that there was a piece of paper sticking out of Nicole's pocket and asked if he could see it. She said no. He asked her what it was, and she told him it was a receipt. Liam found a larger room that was equipped with a video recorder and audio equipment. Billy and the detective sat at the table, but the equipment was not turned on. Liam asked Billy to tell him about his day again, because the information that they were getting was not consistent with what he was saying. Billy started getting nervous again, and he started fidgeting and bouncing his legs. So Lenum pointed out the inconsistencies between his and Nicole's stories. Billy blurted out that they had went to Walmart, that he had almost forgotten. But when asked if it was before or after the bowling alley, he said that now he couldn't remember if they had been at Walmart that day or the day before. He also said that they had talked about going to a movie, but they never did. Detective Lenum asked if Billy's shirt was new, saying it looked new to him. And Billy said that Nicole had bought it for him yesterday. Lenum told Billy that they needed accurate information, and this was going to be an intense investigation. Billy got defensive. Lenum said that he was going to leave Billy for a few minutes to collect his thoughts and calm down. He left the room, walked around the corner, and watched Billy through the two-way mirror. While watching, he saw Billy slapping his hands on the table in, like, frustration or anger. Um, he jumped out of his chair, headed to the corner of the room, and started vomiting in a trash can. Lenum rushed into the room asking if it was okay or if he needed to go to the bathroom, but Billy said he was fine. Lenum told him he'd be back in about five minutes. Detective Sergeant Richard Sprankle was in his office when Lenum approached him, and he said that there were some serious inconsistencies with Billy and Nicole's stories. He also told Sprankle about Billy's actions and behavior. Sprinkle decided that they should both go in and talk to Billy together. Billy was again asked about the day he had spent with Nicole, his family background, and the mental health issues that he had been claiming to have, along with the medications he was currently taking. According to Billy, Sprinkle then told him that Jean was dead, and that her killer would be located as a result of prints found at the crime scene, and that they were going to be getting surveillance tapes from the business located adjacent to Jean's house. Billy then asked 
What am I going to do? He said, I have a lot weighing on my conscience. At that point, Detective Lena started the tape recorder. It was close to 1 a.m. Billy said that he had little to eat all day and was physically and emotionally weak as a result of being in police custody for more than four hours. Detective Lenin announced for the recorder's benefit who he and Sprankle were. And then, you're William Sullivan, right? And Billy responded with, yep. He was then asked if he had a problem with them calling him Billy, and he said that he didn't. He was asked if he knew the interview was going to be recorded, and he said yes that he did, and he didn't have a problem with that. Billy was then read his rights as standard procedure. Billy signed a Miranda rights waiver, and then he was verbally asked if he was willing to to waive his rights and speak with the detectives. Again, Billy answered with, yep. Amanda Kane was sleeping when Chris McGowan knocked on her door. Chris banged and rang the buzzer for a few minutes. Amanda groggily made her way to the door. She could make Chris out through the window, and he urged her to open up. When she opened the door, she told him that she was thinking it might have been the kids again. He asked what she meant, and she told him about Nicole and Billy stopping by earlier. She told Chris to come in and ask what was going on. Chris told Amanda to sit down. He didn't know how to tell her what he needed to. She could sense that something was wrong. So she asked what was going on, and Chris said through tears, she's gone. Amanda asked what he was talking about, and then he said it. It's Jean. She was killed. Amanda softly started crying, and then she asked how. Was there an accident? And Chris said he had no idea. Billy was in one interview suite being questioned, and Nicole in another. When Billy spoke to Lena and Sprankle, Nicole began opening up in the other room just down the hall. One of the first details pertaining to her mother's murder that Nicole spoke about stunned Mark Schaaf. It just seemed too incredible to be true. Nicole claimed that over the past week, she and Billy had tried to murder her mother. Not one time, not twice, but four times. Apparently, Nicole and Billy had laced Jean's coffee creamer with Dimetap, Benadryl, and Ibuprofen. They believed that if she ingested enough of it, then she would die. When that didn't work, they tried adding bleach to Jean's coffee creamer. Jean had thrown the creamer in the garbage, untouched, thinking that it must have went bad. The next plan was to set Jean's room on fire, to make sure that she was locked in it, and when the fire broke out, she wouldn't be able to get out and she would die. They looked for the perfect spot to plant a burning candle so it looked like an accident. But when they tested to see if Jean's blanket was flammable, they found that it didn't easily catch on fire and decided to try something else. They then tried to blow the house up. They used a rope as a fuse and they were going to soak it in gasoline and then feed it into the oil tank that was in the back of the house. Nicole even packed things from her room that she didn't want to be damaged in the fire. While Billy distracted Chris and Jean with conversation, Nicole fed the rope into the oil tank. She then unraveled the remainder of it into the backyard, heading to the edge of the lawn. Chris and Billy ended up making their way outside though and Nicole got scared, so she quickly gathered all of the rope and tossed it into the garbage can outside. Sitting with Nicole, Shafe tried to convince her to explain how things escalated to the point where, as Nicole now claimed, Billy walked into the house and murdered Jean. What was it that drove them to do it? Nicole said, quote, My mom didn't want me and Billy to see each other anymore. I wanted to go live with Billy in Connecticut. My mother never would have let me do that. Before the night was over, Nicole was going to change the entire dynamic of the case with another shocking revelation. Nicole admitted, as the interview progressed, that she had also went into the house. From all of the information that had been gathered from family and friends, it was almost inconceivable that Nicole would have had anything to do with the murder of her mom. From the outside, people close to Jean said that she and Nicole had a very strong relationship. Nicole was her princess, and she was very well behaved. Jean hadn't really had any problems out of her at all. That is, until her relationship with Billy began. Could the same girl who loved her mom so much be the same teenager Mark Schaaf had been interviewing? Had she been manipulated by Billy? Was she even telling the truth about her involvement? Or was she covering for her boyfriend? On the morning of the 7th, 
Chris called work to let them know that he wasn't going to be in, and he tried to explain that Jean had been killed, but it just wouldn't come out correctly, so he said he quickly hung up the phone. After a while of pacing and dozing on and off on the couch, about 8.30 a.m., he received a call from Jennifer Hunt, the victim's advocate that he had met the previous night. She told him that she had some news she wanted him to be aware of before the media got a hold of it. She told him that she had some good news and some bad news. Then she informed him that they had two suspects in custody that they were holding for Jean's death. Chris said it was like a breath of fresh air. He had something to grasp onto, something, you know, someone was going to pay for what they had did to his girlfriend. Nothing could prepare him for what she told him next, though. The two suspects that were in custody were Nicole and Billy. Chris thought he must have misheard her. He asked her what she was talking about. Jennifer went on to tell him that Billy and Nicole had confessed. Still in shock, Chris asked what they had confessed to. Jennifer told him again that they had confessed to doing it, that Billy was the one who did it. Chris still couldn't believe it. He asked why, and Jennifer said that they really didn't know yet, that there was an indication that they wanted to live together in Connecticut. Chris had so many questions. Why would they not just go, take off together? Jennifer said that they didn't have all the information quite yet, and he asked her what happened. And this is when he found out. Billy had went into the house with a bat. He and Jean had fought. There were multiple stab wounds. There was a struggle. Billy hit Jean with the bat in the head and grabbed some knives and started stabbing her. Chris stopped her there. He couldn't hear anymore. Nicole and Billy were now both officially in police custody. They were both talking, but telling very different versions of the events that had taken place on Domain Avenue. There were still so many questions, like had Nicole been brainwashed? Maybe Billy was a psychopath and had murdered before? Did he threaten Nicole? No one really knew him. Then as more and more details emerged, even though kind of scarce, Others wondered if it was Nicole's idea from the start. Had she planned her mom's murder and then manipulated a mentally ill boy into killing her mom and taking the blame, using sexual favors and promises of love? On the morning of August 7th, Attorney General Peter W. Heed and Nashua Police Chief Donald Gross sent out a one-page press release. It read as follows. William Joseph Sullivan Jr., age 18, of Willimantic, Connecticut, has been arrested on charges of first-degree murder in connection with the homicide of Jean Domenico, age 43, of Nashua, New Hampshire. After a brief description of the charges against Billy, outing how he had repeatedly stabbed Jean, the press release outlined the true shocker of the story. The murder charge alleges that Billy acted in concert with and was aided by a 16-year-old juvenile. Related charges have been brought against the minor. Billy's first day in court was scheduled that same day at 2.30 p.m. inside the Nashua District Court. Dennis Lanham and Mark Schaefe had conflicting versions of what had happened to Jean, but they also had confessions from Nicole and Billy in separate interviews. That was all that was needed to arrest the two. Search warrants and affidavits were in the process of being prepared. Billy and Nicole would be in jail while law enforcement collected evidence and built cases against both of them. And now just a little backstory on Nicole and Billy. Uh, they had met in a teen chat room when Billy sent Nicole a direct message. They apparently instantly clicked and within a few days, Nicole had given them her phone number. Nicole was going through a rough patch in life when Billy appeared out of nowhere. She had been depressed and she felt like she didn't even want to be alive anymore. It just served no purpose for her. When Nicole and Billy started talking, he told her everything she wanted to hear. How beautiful she was, how much he loved her laugh and the sound of her voice. He loved her personality. And within a few days, he was telling her that he loved her. Nicole said that she was fascinated with the idea that someone would love her. Within a week, they both felt that they were so deeply in love. She said that Billy had walked into her life at a time when she needed someone most and that they were meant to be. Billy started talking about how he would love to be with her forever. And I mean, what teenage girl doesn't want to hear that? 
when you're that young and you have such strong feelings for someone, you no doubt, you know, you're going to think they're the one. But a few months into the relationship, they were writing or calling each other every day, sometimes several times a day. And Billy showered Nicole with compliments constantly. And Nicole believed in Billy. By this time, Jean was getting concerned. She was Nicole's biggest enemy. The deeper in love Nicole fell with Billy, the more detached she became from Jean, Chris, and Charlie. When Billy and Nicole made their first plans to meet in person, they had wanted Jean to take Nicole to Willimantic for the weekend. Nicole was only 15 and Jean refused to leave her alone at a stranger's house with a boy, even if his mom said she would supervise the visit. Billy kind of took this as a personal attack on him. Near the end of August, Nicole made one final plea to Jean, and Jean finally gave in and said that Nicole would uh, be able to go see Billy, but she was going to chaperone. On August 20th, 2002, Nicole and Jean took off for Connecticut. A few hours later, Nicole walked into a McDonald's in downtown Willimantic and saw Billy for the first time as he worked. Billy introduced her to a few of his co-workers, and when he got off work, Gene drove them to Billy's high school and the middle school he had attended before taking them out to an afternoon movie. During the entire date, Gene was there by her daughter's side, not letting Nicole out of her sight. After the movie, Jean dropped Billy off at home and she met Patricia, Billy's mom, and Billy's sisters. After about an eight-hour visit, Jean said it was time to go. After the visit, though, the relationship between Nicole and Billy just grew more intense, and the need for them to see each other became more of a necessity. And then Billy admitted infidelity to Nicole. He had written her a letter and twisted his words in all the right ways to somehow make Nicole feel like it was her fault that he cheated on her because she wasn't there. Jean finally ended up agreeing to let Nicole go and spend a weekend with Billy with Patricia Sullivan's promise of total supervision. Nicole, Jean, and Chris met Patricia halfway between Nashua and Willimantic. Jean was convinced that Nicole was going to stay a virgin until she was 25, and she trusted Nicole's judgment. But as Nicole later wrote in her diary, this was the weekend she ended up losing her virginity to Billy, and she was extremely happy about what happened. Nicole was already counting the days until they could see each other again after this visit. Any problems or arguments that happened between Billy and Nicole, she started to believe it wasn't him or in his behavior. It was the distance between them. Nicole didn't have a positive sense of self-worth. She had no confidence. She hated her body. She thought she was fat, ugly, stupid. And Billy would just pour on the charm and tell her how wrong she was. Billy had grown up in an abusive household. His mom and dad, uh, William Sr., drank a lot, and he and Patricia would fight often. He once punched her in the face and opened a gash on her head that required 17 stitches while she was holding Billy. After she was stitched up, she called the police and had him arrested. And once he was in jail, Pat took off and moved into an apartment in town. Pat said that Billy had started suffering from nightmares that she believed were brought on by the violent episodes that he had witnessed. Billy's mom didn't stay away from William Long. She found out she was pregnant again, and they tried to make it work. They were eventually evicted from their apartment, and with nowhere to go, they moved into a welfare motel as pat described it one day while the family was out and about that hotel caught on fire pat had heard it on the radio she called william to see if he had heard anything he hadn't but said that he was going to go check it out he took billy with him and they watched the motel burn billy was really scared because he didn't know if any of his friends were in the fire pat said after that she noticed a notable change in billy's demeanor he was having even more trouble sleeping. He had constant nightmares and what he described to doctors as death thoughts. He was only four years old and he would recount thoughts he was having about being killed. Billy was put in therapy months later after he had had several episodes at home that proved that he needed professional help. And after about a year of counseling, Billy started sleeping better. He had stopped acting out against his sisters and seemed more social and calm. 
So Pat took him out of therapy. According to Billy's mom, he was six years old when he first mentioned a desire to commit suicide. Pat had finally divorced William by this time, and she was trying to raise her kids in a healthy environment by herself. She said it was hard on Billy because he had bonded with his dad, and they were close. It seemed that as soon as his father was out of the household, Billy started acting out all over again. He began having out-of-control behavior, and he would throw things and hit things in people. By the time Billy was seven, he had went through kindergarten twice. He had four sisters to contend with, and Pat had moved the family into an apartment complex in Norwich, Connecticut. One weekend, Billy's sister had a sleepover, and one of the little girl's brothers asked if he could stay the night too. And Pat thought it might be good for Billy to get some interaction with a kid his age. The kid slept in tents made out of blankets in one of the upstairs bedrooms. Girls in one tent and boys in another. Pat went upstairs every so often to check on the kids. During one of the trips, she noticed Billy's face was flushed and red, as if he had been running around. She asked Billy what it was going on, and he just shrugged. Pat didn't really think too much of it, assuming that it was just kids being kids, running around and playing hard. A few weeks later, while Billy was in therapy, Pat said she found out that Billy claimed to have been molested by that boy in the tent. From there, Pat noticed a deeper change in Billy. His normal antics of acting out turned more risky. He was jumping off of roofs, jumping out of trees, just in general doing very dangerous things, according to his mom. Pat's oldest son moved out and Billy was devastated. He was close to his half-brother and he looked up to him. So this was another male figure leaving Billy's life. He started to wonder if it was something that he had done or said. Kids do tend to sometimes blame themselves. Billy also went through his grandmother dying and then a neighborhood friend was killed after a truck sitting on a car lift fell on him. Billy once again became suicidal, according to his mom, and he stayed at Elmcrest, which was a psychiatric hospital, for 30 days. While there, Billy became very angry about being taken away from his family. The hospital had to routinely restrain him, and according to Pat, had to often put him in a padded room. When he was released, he did seem a bit calmer, and doctors worked hard to find the right cocktail of medications that would allow Billy to live a somewhat normal life. During the spring of 1994, no sooner did it seem that things were settling down when the trouble started all over again. Billy was older and bigger. He was stronger. Pat had respite workers come to the home to help her with the kids, and Billy went after them one day with a baseball bat. Kind of sounds like his M.O. He threatened to hit one of the workers with it, but instead demolished one of his sister's bicycles with it in a fit of rage. Pat lost the state's help after that incident. Billy was sent back to Elmcrest for another 30-day stay. He came home and continued the same behavior. So Pat tried Newington Children's Hospital. When Billy got out of that hospital, he started hitting his sisters and running away. By the time he turned 11 in 1996, he had been admitted to two more hospitals for the same behavioral issues. In March 1998, an incident took place that showed how deep-seated Billy's problems were. He was sitting in class one day when he looked out the window and saw a truck drive by the school. He knew his father worked for an appliance company as a truck driver, and Billy believed his dad still wanted to see him, but for some reason couldn't, or that he was being told to stay away. Watching the truck out the window, Billy got up from his desk and ran outside. He was yelling, Dad, as the truck drove away from the school. School officials went after Billy as he chased after the truck. He was finally convinced to return to the school, but then he started kicking and screaming. The school called the local hospital and had Billy committed. Billy went through several different hospitals all over Connecticut. He was arrested twice for fighting. His longest residency turned out to be a year at Riverview Children's Hospital in Middletown, Connecticut. It was about an hour away from Willimantic, where Pat and her daughters were now living. Ten days before Halloween, on October 21st, 2002, Billy and Nicole celebrated five months and eight days together. It had been a while since they had seen each other, and Nicole was upset about not knowing when they were going to get to see each other again. Around this time, Billy had told Nicole that he was thinking of taking a break from her. She was obsessed with him, and 
he was her whole world. He wasn't ready for all that. It came with too much pressure and responsibility, he said. So he told her that it wouldn't be permanent, but it felt like Nicole's heart had been ripped out, she said. When Billy suggested taking some time apart, she didn't see a point to her life anymore. She described Billy as her backbone, her heart and air. She begged Billy for forgiveness and promised she'd work harder at making the relationship what he wanted it to be. As Thanksgiving 2002 approached, Billy and Nicole realized they had made it through what had been the roughest, most emotionally trying period of the relationship. Nicole's obsession with Billy grew. She felt closer to him now than she ever had. The harder Nicole fell for Billy, the more she grew to resent her mother, and that grew into pure hatred. Nicole was convinced that all the problems she had with Billy were all Jean's fault. The next visit was scheduled for December 27th. Nicole was counting down the days. Pat was going to drive Billy partway, and Billy was going to spend the weekend in Nashua. Nicole was still trying to figure out a way to talk to her mom. Uh, she wanted to talk to her about moving to Connecticut to live with Billy. She thought that if she could just make Jean understand how much Billy meant to her and how happy he made her, that she wouldn't be able to say no. She ended up writing Jean a letter, promising to be respectful to her, to do her chores without being asked, and avoid any arguments at home. She told Jean, quote, I just want to get out of this hellhole and go back to heaven. Just before Christmas, Jean and Nicole met Pat and Billy in Worcester. Billy was supposed to have his license by then, but he didn't have enough money or a car. He promised Nicole that he would have it soon, though. Billy's stay in Nashua during Christmas was pretty insignificant, uh, at least to Chris and Jean. He seemed like a good kid, rather harmless. He came off as quiet and reserved. In February 2003, Nicole spent the weekend in Connecticut, and once again when she left, she experienced the separation anxiety again when they parted. She cried during much of the two-hour trip home. If Jean hoped the visits helped her daughter understand that a long-distance relationship was destined to fail, it wasn't working. Shortly after returning, Nicole got into an argument over the phone with her dad, Anthony. After the call, she ran into the garage and screamed that the whole world was against her. She wrote to Billy that night telling him that her dad was awful. She said no one ever listened to her or what she had to say, except for Billy. She explained that without him, she would feel as though she were nothing, and that he was her motivation for everything. Nicole wrote her mother another letter. She was willing to do anything to try to convince Jean to let her move in with Billy. She talked about how unhappy she was at home and the fact that she had no friends. She tried to tell her mom some of the good things that would come from her moving to Connecticut with Billy, like the phone bill would be lower and their mother-daughter relationship would actually grow stronger because Nicole promised to call her every day. Nicole wrote, quote, I don't want to live here anymore. Nicole knew that it hurt Jean's feelings to hear these things, but she felt that it had to be said. Her life revolved around Billy, and nothing was going to change how she felt. She ended the letter with, quote, My fate lies in your hands. Please, let me be happy. According to Nicole, Jean got pissed after reading the letter. She stomped upstairs and confronted Nicole, telling her that she was her child and she was not leaving the house until she was 18. She asked Nicole if she was out of her mind. Jean told Nicole that once she was 18, she could do whatever she wanted. But for now, Jean owned her pretty much. Nicole said later in court that she expected that reaction from Jean. She said she was sad about it, but not surprised. In May, Nicole and Billy celebrated the one-year anniversary of their relationship. Billy's mother met Jean in Worcester again, and Billy spent the weekend in Nashua. Billy had his license this time, but still no car. When Billy left, Nicole fell into the deepest depression she had ever experienced. She was now entirely convinced that without Billy, life wasn't worth living. On June 6, 2003, Nicole turned 16. Billy was the first person she spoke to in the morning when she woke up. Nicole thought that she was that much closer to liberating herself from Jean and breaking free. In just 24 months, Nicole was prepared to walk out of the house an adult and go live wherever the hell she wanted. 
To Nicole, Jean was no longer a loving mother. She was now a selfish bitch. Even on her birthday, Nicole believed Jean was going to ruin it. Jean bought pizza that night, and they had cake and ice cream. Then Nicole opened gifts. She got money, Spongebob stickers, and a birthday card. While they were celebrating, the phone rang. It was a salesperson from the phone company, confirming that Jean was now on a plan that allowed Nicole to call Billy any time she wanted to talk, and for as long as she desired. But the telephone plan, cake, pizza, and a birthday card weren't about to make up for what Nicole saw as Jean's perseverance to end her relationship with Billy. Nicole totally believed that God had brought them together. Billy started planning a surprise visit to see Nicole. He said that it was always her dream for him just to show up. They were supposed to meet in Worcester uh, like they normally did, but Billy pulled into Nicole's driveway in his new car on August 1st, 2003. Nicole ran into his arms, and it was the picture-perfect moment that Billy had hoped for. Nicole helped Billy get settled in the house. Jean's best friend Amanda had purchased a house and had been moving in over the past few days. They were going to help Amanda unpack the next day. According to Billy and Nicole, murdering Jean started off between them as a joke, a conversation with smiles that turned into a serious conversation about killing her. They talked about how life would be better and they could be together. And Billy said that it was honestly all he could think about. Nicole. While Jean was at work on Tuesday, the two teens sat in Billy's car in the parking lot of the bank in back of Jean's house. It was there that they first talked about using violence to change the predicament they found themselves in. Billy later referred to it as a dry run. In the days leading up to this moment, Nicole and Billy had put the bleach in the coffee creamer Jean used. They had tried to light the bed on fire. They had tried the rope soaked in gasoline being put in the oil tank. Now, Billy insisted, it was time to get serious. He told Nicole that he would confront her and just hit her with a bat. No matter how Billy and Nicole felt about murdering Jean, their original plan was not to stab or even kill her. The two teens sat in Billy's car the day before the crime was going to take place, staring at the house, plotting and planning every move. Billy told Nicole, I'll just sneak up behind her, nail her and walk out, maybe twice, a one-two thing. I'll walk in and walk out, and that's it. If anything, I'll walk out with the baseball bat. Nicole said that as much as she hated her mother, she still had reservations and didn't believe they would actually see it through. She believed it was all a fantasy. It was ultimately Billy's plan to attack Jean from behind, so she wouldn't know who it was. Therefore, maybe she would think that they weren't in such a safe place after all, and then maybe let Nicole move out, or move the whole family closer. Billy said that he never would have thought that he and Jean would get into a fight, and that it would go that far. The original plan, up to an hour and a half before it happened, was if Billy was to hit her in the head, then it was basically in fate's hands. Since not everyone dies from a head wound, they could just get a concussion or something. The morning of August 6, 2003, it was hot. Billy and Nicole woke up around 11 a.m. No one was home. Nicole and Billy had sex and then talked about how their plan was really going to work and that it was the perfect idea. They had initiated a plan the previous day and slept on it. Apparently now a decision had been made. They both cleaned up and then went driving around. They spent most of the day talking about their plan. Around 4.40 p.m., Billy suggested going to Lita Lane's to bowl. Bowling sounded fun, but Nicole also admitted it was the perfect place to create an alibi. It was the only reason they ended up going. During the drive to the bowling alley, Billy and Nicole tortured themselves with the quandary they found themselves in, with Billy having to head back to Connecticut the following morning. They felt that separation was going to be devastating. Spending the last week together had made their bond even stronger. After the bowling alley, they went to Dunkin' Donuts and sat in the parking lot talking, planning, and running through what was going to happen in the coming hours. Billy explained that he would go into the house and approach Jean with a bat. The plan was to make it look like a robbery. When they left Dunkin' Donuts, Billy drove by Nicole's house. He asked if she saw her mother's car, and she said it was there. Jean was home with the pizza, 
waiting for everyone to show up for dinner. When Billy and Nicole realized Jean was home, Billy made a U-turn and drove back by the house. Billy then took a right into the parking lot of 7-Eleven on the corner of Deerwood and Amherst. They were one block from the house. Parking in a space close to and facing Deerwood gave Billy and Nicole a clear view of Jean's comings and goings. Billy suggested that they go into the store. A police officer pulled into the parking lot. They went into the store, and the police officer stood in line behind them. They got paranoid that someone must know something, and they left the 7-Eleven parking lot. The police officer pulled out right behind them. Nicole told Billy to turn into Brusters to see if the officer followed them into the parking lot. When Billy pulled into the lot of Brusters, the police officer continued on. Near 6 p.m., Billy and Nicole pulled into the parking lot of 7-Eleven for a second time. Billy told Nicole to go into the store and wander around and look at things, saying he'd be back in two minutes. Nicole was torn now. She saw the incident with the police officer as a sign and thought that she might not want to go through with it now. But as Billy made his way out of the parking lot and across Deerwood Drive, Nicole didn't do anything to stop him. It didn't take any time at all for Billy to be in the bank parking lot which was directly behind Jean's house. Billy said that's when he began questioning what he was about to do. During the final moments of her life, Jean Domenico sat at her small dining room table in the kitchen. She had purchased a cheese pizza directly across the street from 7-Eleven at Chow's for Chris and the kids. It was on the counter next to her, staying warm under a towel. Jean planned to have a separate meal because she was currently on the Atkins diet. The door flung open and Billy walked in. Jean looked up at him, and Billy later said that he stared at her and saw the plan he and Nicole previously had discussed play back in his mind, as though it were a scene from a movie or something. Billy kept telling himself in his head that he had two minutes, just go in and get it done. But as he saw Jean just sitting there, going back to whatever it was she was doing, he realized it wasn't going to be that easy. He said hi to her and walked into Charlie's room without saying anything more. The plan was to grab the baseball bat that was behind Charlie's bedroom door and smash Jean in the head without saying a word. One quick swing and out the door. Billy picked up the aluminum baseball bat and walked back to where Jean was now standing by the kitchen stove. I hate the Yankees, Billy said. Can you believe the Braves lost, Jean said moving toward the kitchen table, sitting down again. Jean had always been a big baseball fan. Billy said no, he couldn't believe it. Billy placed the bat beside the entertainment center in the living room, just beyond the kitchen. Jean and Billy made small talk about baseball for a few minutes, and while talking, they made their way into the living room and sat on the couch. Billy picked up the bat and pretended to swing it like one of his childhood Boston Red Sox heroes. Jean told him to put the bat down. It was making her nervous. Billy said she seemed uncomfortable. She didn't want him to swing the bat in the house. Billy picked up Nicole's cordless phone, which had its own line, and called his cell phone. Nicole was sitting in his car at the 7-Eleven. She asked him what was going on. Jean had walked into another part of the house, and Billy told Nicole that Jean was getting nervous. You're not going to do it, are you? asked Nicole. I have to go, Nicole. Why are you taking so long? She asked him. And he said bye. Jean came into the room and said for Billy to tell Nicole to get her ass home. Billy hung up the phone and tried to carry on the conversation about baseball, trying to keep Jean focused on him rather than Nicole. Jean asked Billy what was going on, and Nicole's phone rang and Billy answered it, knowing that it was her. She told Billy that there was a cop at the bank. When Billy found out that the cop was taking money out of the ATM, though, he told Nicole not to worry about it, that everything would be okay. Jean got upset at this point, and according to Billy, she started screaming at him, and she walked back into the kitchen from the living room. Billy and Jean then started arguing. The argument got very heated, and Billy said that he doesn't remember the actual words that were spoken, but he said that he reached a point of no return. With her back facing him, 
Billy swung the bat. He said his plan was to hit her on the back of the head. He missed, though, and hit her across her back, leaving a welt from Jean's right armpit up toward her left elbow. The impact of the blow pushed Jean against the wall by the attic door and startled her. She didn't go down, though, and that shocked Billy. After she realized what had happened, she turned, Billy said, holding her side, and asked him what the fuck he was doing. Billy later said that after he struck her in the back, he swung again and hit her in the head. Sketches by the medical examiner support this claim, as well as crime scene photographs, which show a large split in the back of Jean's skull. Once Billy had hit Jean with the bat, he knew he had already lost Nicole. Now that he had exposed his true self to Jean, there was no way she would ever allow him to see Nicole again. He thought he needed to finish it. Billy lunged at Jean and they both fell on the coffee table in the living room, breaking it into pieces. They fought for a few minutes, scratching, kicking, and pulling hair. Billy claimed it was a struggle to keep Jean down on the floor and that she was much stronger than he had expected. At some point, Jean had even managed to run for the kitchen door. While Billy and Jean were fighting inside the house, Nicole sat in Billy's car reading a magazine that she had purchased inside the 7-Eleven. Jean almost made it to the door, but Billy was right behind her and he pulled her back into the house. She fell to the floor and tried to get up, but Billy pushed her down again. According to Billy, Jean sat on the floor, caught her breath, and then tackled him. He said he then figured, since he already started, he might as well finish. Billy was able to break free from Jean and he ran into the kitchen and grabbed a steak knife off the counter. Jean tried to collect herself so she could defend herself. Billy then ran and lunged at Jean with the knife and stabbed her on the corner of her right shoulder, burying the knife down to her bone. He used so much force, the knife blade broke off, sprang back like a diving board, and nicked his hand. Then it fell to the floor. Billy then grabbed a second knife from the butcher block set. He went straight for Jean's upper body. Billy said that he stabbed her a few times in the throat. In the interview, he said, quote, I just figured he laughed here while recounting the attack to police. Um, point of no return. No going back now. I was scared. At some point, while Billy stuck Jean with a second knife, he dropped it on the floor. Jean got up off the ground, picked the knife up, and ran at him. But as she tried to stab him, she slipped on her own blood, bumped into Billy's side, and went head first into the plexiglass portion of the door, pushing the middle window out in a web-like crack. From there, Billy grabbed a third knife and let loose, stabbing Jean anywhere he could get in a blow. He kept going and going until Jean stopped fighting. Later in police interviews, Billy said he remembered stabbing Jean eight times. In reality, the medical examiner counted more than 40 stab wounds. She had two in her back, one in her wrist, seven to her chest and throat, six to her face, 13 on the right side of her head, two on the left side of her head, and nine in the back of her neck and head. When Billy finally stopped stabbing Jean, He went straight for the door. He didn't notice that he had left bloody prints on the knives he had used, the baseball bat, a palm print on the refrigerator, and a large print of his hand on the carpet in the living room. Not to mention the several bloody footprints throughout the living room. As Billy grabbed the door handle to leave, he looked down. He noticed blood all over his clothes, face, and hands. He was covered. Jean had a punctured lung and was struggling to breathe. Billy was freaking out. Shit, what do I do now? He then remembered Jean saying, Okay, I'm done. As she took her last breath. Nicole was getting nervous. She was sitting in Billy's car at 7-Eleven waiting for him to return. She was wondering what was taking him so long. And Billy was panicking as he stood by the door, wondering what to do next. He had just murdered Jean. He was covered with blood. He needed to change clothes, get back to the car, and get out of town. 
Billy said he stepped over Jean's body and ran up the stairs. He left a bloody trail of footprints throughout the house without even realizing it. When he got upstairs, he grabbed the first jacket he saw and ran back downstairs and threw the jacket on the floor next to Jean. He spread it out. He then stripped down to his underwear, placed all of his clothes in the jacket, folded it up, and went into the bathroom to wash the blood off of his hands and arms before putting on a fresh set of clothes. After getting dressed, he ran out the door and headed for 7-Eleven. Nicole was leaning against the back hood reading a magazine when Billy came up. Billy then realized that he left his inhaler in the house and said he needed a towel. He told Nicole that she had to go in the house and get it. Nicole asked him why he was wearing different clothes, and he told her that he had to change in the house because there was so much blood. And when Nicole took a closer look at him, she noticed he still had blood on his face and shirt. He told her again that she had to go back in the house, and he started the car. He said he needed a wet towel to clean himself off, and he wanted her to check to make sure he didn't leave anything behind. Nicole told him she couldn't do it, and Billy argued that she needed to do her part and help him. He sped out of the 7-Eleven parking lot and towards Jean's house. Nicole was crying uncontrollably, telling Billy that she, she couldn't do it. She didn't want to see it. She knew what he had done, and she didn't want to. Billy pulled into Jean's driveway. He told Nicole to get out, and he would meet her in the bank parking lot. Nicole opened the breezeway door and grabbed the screen door handle, then tried to push open the solid door that led into the house, but it wouldn't move. Something was blocking it from behind. Nicole was able to force it open just a crack, and she could see that it was Jean's body blocking the door. Nicole pushed the door with everything she had, and she was able to get inside the house. She saw her mother, dead on the floor. Blood was all over the room, and the house was ransacked and looked like it had been burglarized. Jean's eyes were open. Nicole stepped over her mama's body and made her way into the bathroom. She grabbed a towel and wet it, then headed for the door. As she made her way back through the kitchen, she noticed the broken knife blade on the floor, so she picked it up and left. Billy was pulling into the bank parking lot as she was coming out of her backyard. There was a sewer drain near, so she tossed the knife blade into the drain and then hopped into the car. Apparently, Nicole was freaking out when she got back in the car. She couldn't believe that her mom was dead. Billy was trying to calm her down. Nicole was terrified. They went to the mall after getting money from an ATM, and Nicole ran in and bought Billy a shirt, since the one he was wearing had blood on it. Then they stopped at a J.C. Penney down the road, and Nicole ran in and got him some pants and socks. She put the receipt in her front pocket. They pulled in at the movie theater and went to the back parking lot where Billy changed clothes. They started driving towards Massachusetts, and a few exits east of Nashua, Billy pulled in where he saw a sign to overlook golf course in Hollis. Billy found a dirt road and pulled into a somewhat secluded area. Nicole grabbed everything out of the trunk, which was the bat and everything Billy had wrapped up in the jacket back at Jean's house, plus all of the clothes out of the back seat. She put them in a bag and tossed the bag behind a tree. After this is when they stopped and made that short visit with Amanda, Jean's best friend. Then after one more stop at Dunkin' Donuts, just to sh make sure nothing had been missed in the trunk, which they had missed something, there was a knife handle, uh, Nicole threw that in the bushes near where they had parked. They then headed back to Jean's house. Later that night and into the morning hours of Thursday, August 7th, Nicole sat with Detective Mark Schaefe and described her role in her mother's murder. Nicole said she realized there was no way out of it once she and Billy were separated and they started hounding them with pointed questions. Schaefe told Nicole that they had found blood in the car. He said, you know, Nicole, manslaughter isn't as bad a charge as homicide. Nicole tried to come up with a story that might still get her out of trouble. She told the detective that she and her mom had gotten into an argument and that Jean had hit her and pulled her into the house, telling her not to leave. She explained that Billy was there and he got really, really angry that Jean was hurting Nicole. And then he went after Jean. Sometime later, Shave told Nicole that Billy was in another room, telling detectives a different story. 
Ultimately, Nicole broke down and told detectives everything she knew. And from what I've read, she even told detectives how cold Billy seemed after he had stabbed Jean. By the time Nicole left the Nashua Police Department on her way to the county jail in Manchester, she was fully prepared to face off with Billy, the man that she had devoted her life and entire heart to. It would be her word against his. She was told that Billy was talking about the murder. He was telling the whole story. So she knew turning on Billy was her only hope. As Nicole and Billy started their journey through the justice system, Billy couldn't help but disrupt the progress of his defense. He was having a hard time dealing with his court-appointed attorneys, James Quay and Jewel Nye. Since pleading not guilty in October 2003, he was being held without bail. Nye and Quay were trying to build the best defense they could on Billy's behalf. Of course, they needed Billy's input and his honesty, but Billy didn't seem all that interested in helping. On October 23, 2003, a grand jury indicted Billy on charges of conspiracy to commit murder. From November 2003 to April 2004, the rift between Billy and his lawyers spiraled out of control. Billy wrote several letters to his lawyers and Marshall Buttrick, the chief court clerk. Billy couldn't control himself or his outbursts. Nicole and Billy had not spoken since they were both put in jail, and as far as Billy saw it, Nicole had sold him out when she dropped a dime. From what Billy was hearing now, Nicole had been talking about a deal to save herself from a life sentence, which was going to mean she would have to testify against Billy. And Billy couldn't let that happen. So, while Billy's in jail, this 15-year-old girl that we're going to call Tina, uh, because that's what her name was in one of the books I was reading, uh, she lived with her parents in Manchester. Tina said that she didn't have the best relationship with her parents, so she spent a lot of time at her friend Danielle's house. Danielle was older and already out of school, and she was dating a guy who had spent some time in the county jail and he called Danielle every chance he could. Sometimes Danielle would be at work, so Tina would take the call. Once, while talking to Tina, he started talking about his cellmate and how he kind of felt bad for the guy because he didn't seem to have anyone to talk to. Billy was in jail awaiting trial and was apparently annoying the shit out of his cellmate with his life stories. So the guy tells Billy about Tina and Tina agreed to talk to him. She felt like he wasn't a threat. He was someone she could talk to and not have to worry about hurting her since he was locked up. She had no idea why he was in prison, but she told Danielle's boyfriend to tell Billy to write her. Billy saw Tina as a lifeline to the outside world, a connection with freedom. His first letters were simple, just introducing himself and focusing on Tina's likes and dislikes. But as the weeks went by, they grew closer and more intimate through letters and phone calls. Billy told her that he was being wrongly accused of a crime he didn't commit. Billy's strong personality became one reason why Tina respected him. He seemed more in touch with how he felt than any of the guys she had ever dated. Soon, the letters and phone calls weren't enough for Billy. He wanted a face to go with the emotional connection they had made. So Tina sent Billy a photo of herself. Tina had no idea that she was falling in love with a murderer a man who admitted to beating his girlfriend's mother with a baseball bat before stabbing her to death. Billy told Tina that he had been set up by the police and by Nicole, and she believed him. The written communication continued between Billy and Tina, and soon they were talking about being in love and getting married when Tina finished high school, and Billy got out and beat the charges. Billy was filling this girl's head with all the same lame-ass lines that he had said to Nicole, and Tina was falling for it. Tina thought that Billy was the love of her life, but Billy had the girl right where he wanted her. They were just counting down the days until they could have their first face-to-face -face visit. Billy had manipulated Tina into thinking the entire state of New Hampshire, the newspapers, television stations, lawyers, Nicole, everybody was out to get him. He was being framed. It was all a setup. Billy's aunt picked Tina up at a local Manchester pharmacy on August 16th, and they drove to the jail. Maybe Tina was naive, or she had been expecting too much, but the visit didn't live up to her expectations. She sat across from Billy with two inches of plexiglass between them, talking on a prison phone. It was loud and dirty, 
It smelled like a men's locker room. All of the fantasies she had of living a perfect life with Billy were washed away by the reality of prison. Tina's parents eventually found out who she had been talking to, and one time when he called, they asked Billy to stop calling their house. Billy and Tina still wrote and talked, though. They would talk about Tina getting emancipated from her parents if they wouldn't accept the relationship between them. Tina's parents followed Billy's case, and they both thought without a doubt that he was guilty. So Tina ended up lying to her parents and telling them that she had broken it off with Billy since they were pressuring her to stop talking to him. Billy started writing to Tina, telling her how Nicole was making things hard for him in jail. His letters started getting shorter, and at one point he told Tina he was so depressed, he was thinking of suicide. On September 5th, Billy asked Tina to get word to Nicole that he wasn't planning on testifying against her. He told Tina that if Nicole didn't testify, they would both walk. The plan was for Tina to put a note inside a law book in the jail where Nicole was being held. Then to send Nicole a letter telling her in some secret code that Billy had created where to find that note. He told Tina that his life was in her hands. Billy brought up to Tina how she might think about running away from home and going to live with his aunt in Rhode Island. He told her that nothing could keep them away from each other. When the next letters came, Tina was feeling torn between her feelings for Billy and a fear of what she had gotten herself into. In one of the letters, Billy confessed to killing Jean. This terrified Tina. She had thought he was innocent this entire time. Tina felt as though she had to end the relationship. So the next time Billy called, she started crying and told him that she was pregnant. She told Billy that she didn't want to be with him and she was having a baby with someone else. The next time Billy called the house, Tina's mom answered and told him to never call again. The following day, Tina's mom called the Nashville Police Department. Despite Billy's obvious, rational, and predictable behavior during his relationship with Tina, and the fact that Billy had gave police a videotaped confession, a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity was in theory the only chance to escape the worst possible sentence, life without the possibility of parole. Billy could settle for confinement in a mental hospital, a place he was quite familiar with. So an insanity plea is often interpreted to mean the person being charged with the crime is mentally incapable of understanding what he or she has done. Or that at the time of the crime, the suspect could not deduce right from wrong. Insanity pleas are usually a desperate effort and hardly the best defense to present to a jury. Billy had confessed and Nicole was going to testify against him. The forensic evidence collected was going to back up Nicole's testimony and Billy's confession beyond a reasonable doubt. One misconception is that if an insanity defendant wins his or her case, at some point down the road, he or she will be allowed to walk away from confinement. When in reality, according to an article published by the University of Pittsburgh in 2002, actual statistics show that defendants who were found not guilty by reason of insanity actually spent more time confined to institutions than people who were convicted and served prison sentences. The odds were against Billy, but his lawyers were fully prepared to show jurors that their client had a long history of mental illness. On Monday, March 28, 2005, Nicole made a plea bargain with the state. In court, she pleaded guilty to second degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder. And this paved the way for her testimony against Billy. Then, to make matters worse, the prosecutors filed a motion on April 25th to admit evidence that the defendant attempted to tamper with a witness and provide false evidence. Referring to Tina by her initials to protect her identity, the motion laid out the relationship Billy had initiated with Tina and quoted several letters he had written to her. Every word that Billy had ever written to Tina and Nicole as well was going to be part of his trial. By May 2005, almost two years since Jean Domenico's death, Attorneys on both sides began sifting through what seemed like an endless list of motions, rulings, and evidence. Some were saying the trial was going to last anywhere between five to seven weeks. The charges against Billy 
were extremely tough matters to prove in court. A jury could be swayed easily. I mean, Billy was only 18 when he murdered Jean. It would only take one mother on the jury to feel sorry for him and bam, mistrial. Or worse, an acquittal. Billy basically launched a campaign as pretrial hearings got underway in May to try to reinforce his argument that he was insane. As the first hearing was set to begin, Billy's mental capacity to even take part in the trial was an issue. The hearing for May had to be postponed due to a surprise second hearing on Billy's mental competence to stand trial. It all began in late 2004. Billy's attorney first raised the issue of whether Billy understood what was happening to him and was sane enough to participate in his own defense. In November 2004, after a brief hearing on the matter, in which Billy's lawyers failed to explain the actual reason that brought about their concern, Judge Hicks listened as they explained how their client wasn't taking his prescribed antipsychotic medication regularly. There was also an argument about the medication itself. The defense lawyers presented witnesses and what evidence they had to support their claims that Billy was not sane during the murder. The state psychiatrist explained that Billy was, in fact, pretty defensive and not willing to suddenly give a confession and that he had denied any involvement in the crime and only later began to reveal his involvement. In his professional opinion, the psychiatrist added, if Billy was mentally disposed and had not known the difference between right and wrong, there was no way he could have spoken with detectives in the manner he did, and that by clinical definition alone, Billy's behavior on the night of August 6, 2003, in and of itself, proved he knew exactly what he was doing, what he was saying, and more important, what he was leaving out of the conversation with police. In the courtroom, Billy sensed the tide shifting away from his argument, apparently because as the psychiatrist spoke, Billy became restless and disturbed, whispering things in his lawyer's ear and writing on a notepad in front of him. Judge Hicks denied Billy's claim of incompetence. Jury selection was set to begin on June 7, 2005, as the first hearing got underway on June 1st. But first came the defense and state presenting witnesses concerning trial evidence. Part of Billy's pretrial argument included the notion that the stress of being questioned by the police so quickly after the crime rendered him incapable of making a voluntary decision to waive his constitutional right to remain silent and request an attorney. Beyond that, Garrity and Monteith, Billy's lawyers, fought against the videotaped confession Billy agreed to give on the night of the murder. They claimed it should be thrown out on the same grounds and that the fingerprint evidence police collected shouldn't be allowed into trial because police searched Jean's house without a warrant. Nicole Kaczynska celebrated her 18th birthday behind bars on Monday, June 6, 2005. By New Hampshire law, Nicole was now an adult. You can only imagine what she must have been thinking to herself. If only I would have waited. But instead of running away into Billing's arms, she sat in prison waiting to testify against him, anticipating what sentence the court was going to give her. The judge had made a ruling that Nicole, although she had pleaded guilty and cut a deal with the state, was not going to be sentenced until Billy's trial was completed. All she could do was sit, wait, and prepare for the day she faced Billy again. Jury selection was underway, as were discussions and arguments over allowing certain pieces of evidence into trial. Chris McGowan prepared himself emotionally for the trial. When Chris took the stand as the second day of pretrial hearing started, he recounted for the judge what he found on the evening of August 6, 2003. After arriving at Jean's and seeing her on the kitchen floor and he said a puddle of blood. It was the first time that the community was hearing firsthand of the horror inside Jean's home. Now everyone had a mental image. Chris had gained about 40 pounds since Jean's death. He hadn't been leaving the house much. Although it had been two years now since her murder, therapy and what ifs took up a whole lot of space in his mind. There were days when Chris drove around town listening to music that he and Jean had enjoyed together, and when he felt he needed to talk to Jean or get close to her, he would drive the two hours to her grave in Massachusetts 
and eat a picnic lunch by her graveside. Chris had no desire to move on. He couldn't, even after two years, picture himself with another woman. Maybe the trial could put some closure to it all, but maybe not. After Chris finished testifying, NPD officer Kurt Gautier explained how he had responded to the 911 call and met Chris at the front door, shortly before entering the house and determining Jean was dead. By the end of the week, word came down that Nicole Kazanskis, the one person who could place Billy at the scene of the crime and, in a sense, corroborate the state's allegations, was going to take the stand early the following week. It would be the first time since they were separated by police in front of Jean's house on the night of August 6th that Billy and Nicole were going to be in the same room together. Nicole Kazinskis had put on a little bit of weight since her incarceration, but still had that same cute look that Billy had fallen in love with. Her hair was thick, dark black, and flowing halfway down her back. She looked somber and subdued walking into the courtroom, wearing an orange jumpsuit over a white t-shirt. She was definitely not the child that Billy had so easily manipulated. Nicole was on the stand because Billy's lawyers had called her as a witness. They wanted to reinforce their theory that cops failed to give Billy the option of calling an attorney before giving police his very detailed confession. Nicole said she and Billy had discussed how they were to approach police once they returned to the house. Then she explained Billy's temperament on the night he killed Jean. Nicole said, quote, he was very upset. He kept having flashbacks, seeing what had happened. He kept freaking out, hitting the steering wheel. I was trying to calm him down. I was a wreck. I didn't know what to think, what to do. I was beyond help at that point. Nicole then claimed that police immediately separated them when they returned to the scene of the crime. Nicole also said that once they were at the NPD, no one told her she could leave if she wanted. It never occurred to her that she didn't have to go to the police department to give a statement. There was a point in questioning when Billy's lawyer said to Nicole, and you told Billy, do it or else, right? And Nicole actually laughed in response to that accusation. You taught Billy, do it or else, right? <laughs> I didn't, I'm sorry to laugh, but you're making me sick. Billy and Nicole never made direct eye contact throughout her day-long testimony. Billy was seen taking notes and whispering in his attorney's ear at times, but Nicole avoided any chance of looking at him. After 11 hours of testimony over a three-day period, the judge allowed expert testimony regarding fingerprint identification during trial, but said that as far as Billy's videotaped confession, he was going to make a decision at a later date on that. On June 13th, 2005, Billy arrived at the courthouse wearing a blue dress shirt, gray slacks, and black shoes. His face appeared to be broken out with acne, and his eyes were dark and droopy. Jury the selection was still going on as Monday turned into Tuesday. Judge Hicks ruled videotaped evidence was not going to be a part of the trial. This was a win for the defense. When jury selection was completed later that week, six men and nine women, ranging in age from their early 20s to late 60s, were chosen. Monday, June 20th, 2005, the trial was finally underway. The courtroom was packed. On the first day of the trial, the jurors took a field trip, along with Billy and his lawyers and four deputy sheriffs. Vans escorted the crew to Jean's house and then around the corner to the 7-Eleven, where Nicole said she waited for Billy. After that, they made a quick trip to the bank across the street, and then they headed to Overlook Golf Course, where Billy and Nicole dumped much of the evidence. Before ending the road trip, they visited Pheasant Lane Mall, where the state could prove they went shopping after the murder. The following morning, June 21st, Assistant AG Kirsten Wilson stood in front of the jurors and laid the groundwork for the state's case. She began with the words she knew would have the most impact, Quote, the defendant and Nicole had been plotting ways to kill Jean Domenico all week because Jean would not allow her daughter to live with the defendant in Connecticut. The defendant and Nicole knew that they had to succeed with the plot on August 6th because unless they killed Nicole's mother, 
the defendant was scheduled to return to Connecticut without Nicole the following day. It was important to Will Delker and Kirsten Wilson of the prosecution to keep the focus on both Billy and Nicole. She was just as guilty in their eyes. Wilson explained how Jean had arrived home and found herself facing a teenager with a baseball bat in his hands. Next, she talked about the murder itself, explaining the horror and brutality she believed Jean faced on that night. She made it a point to explain how Jean struggled to escape, and when Billy's knife broke off, he just grabbed another one and continued stabbing. Wilson also reminded jurors that each action Billy took before and after murdering Jean was not made by a man who suffered from mental illness, but a man who knew exactly what he was doing. The murder was premeditated and planned. An insane man could not go to such lengths. More importantly, she mentioned again that Nicole and Billy had focused for days and made attempt after attempt after attempt on Jean's life. Toward the end of her opening statement, Wilson said, quote, Altogether, the defendant inflicted over 40 stab wounds before Jean uttered her last words. Okay, I'm done. The state submits, ladies and gentlemen, that all of these actions are cold, calculated, and extremely selfish, but they are not the product of insanity, and we ask that you hold him accountable, she said, pointing to Billy. He had a smirk on his face. Monteith stood up from his seat next to Billy to address the jury with the opening statement from the defense. He addressed the jurors in a calm manner, explaining the facts as he and Garrity saw them. They both believed that Billy was insane. Monteith agreed that it was a horrific crime. They weren't disputing that. It was a very sad case. But this case was going to be about insanity, mental illness, and mental disorders. From there, Monteith went through and explained the many hospital stays Billy endured throughout his young life. Then he walked jurors through the long list of medications Billy had been on. He later stated, quote, He did hit Jean Domenico, and he did stab her and stab her. Sadly, that does support our case here, but this crime is nothing but a product of his mental illness. We have to take William Sullivan as he is. Billy is not normal. He is still ill. The crime was nothing but a product of his mental illness. Nobody, not in his position, would do this. Nobody would do this. Billy is not guilty by means of insanity. He had suffered these illnesses. This crime was a product of those illnesses. These were important points and a strong statement made by the defense, and the jury could accept them, perhaps on some level. Dr. Bernard Burrell was questioned. He was a staff member of Riverview Children's Hospital in Middletown, Connecticut, and had been for nearly two decades. Burrell was the doctor in charge of Billy's case when he became part of the state of Connecticut's psychiatric system. Billy was 13 at the time. Throughout his testimony, Burrell seemed to back up the defense's core argument. Billy was insane. That he knew not what he did and couldn't possibly be held accountable for his actions. It was in his professional opinion that Billy be locked up in an institution so he could get the help that he should have gotten a long time ago. The defense also called Dr. Richard Barnum, a child adolescent psychiatrist with nearly 30 years of experience. He had been hired to evaluate Billy. Barnum testified that he believed the murder was definitely the product of Billy's mental illness, and if it weren't for the mental illness, this would have never happened. Closing arguments were put off for a day. Billy's lawyers decided that they were going to lay out Billy's entire mental history once more for the jury. Several people brought to the attention of court officials that one juror in particular, a former state representative, had nodded off during certain portions of the trial. There was no way that the man could be objective and look at all the evidence simply because he wasn't awake for some of it. It was said that he had no right to decide the fate of a man on trial for murder, a man facing life in prison. After the first 10-hour deliberation day, Judge Hicks was informed of problems with the same sleepy juror. Judge Hicks ended up replacing the juror with one of the alternates, and deliberation started over. Once word came in that the jury had reached its verdict, 
The court promised it would give everyone 30 minutes to make it back into the courtroom. Billy refused to be present during the verdict. The jury foreperson stood and pronounced Billy guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Now that Billy was a convicted murderer, the judge demanded he be present for his sentencing. The prosecutors argued that Gene's friends and family deserved a chance to address him. Shockingly, court officers carried Billy into the courtroom in shackles after he refused to be present for his sentencing. It was said that his eyes were glazed over and tears were running down his cheeks, but it was also rumored that Billy had been pepper sprayed by court officers when they were trying to get him under control so he could go in front of the judge. Regardless, Billy Sullivan was forced to sit and listen to Judge Hicks's sentence, whether he wanted to or not. Chris addressed Billy on behalf of Jean, and Chris talked about what a good person Jean was and how she was a friend to everyone even Billy. Chris broke down in sobs, and Billy stood, not really listening, smiling coyly. As Chris continued with his impact statement, Billy lashed out at him. Fuck you. Fuck you, Chris, Billy shouted, and his lawyers tried to contain him. Billy and his attorneys had made the decision that Billy wasn't going to make a statement, and after Gene's brother Chuck spoke and Jennifer Hunt, the victim's advocate, read a few brief words written by other members of Gene's immediate family, Judge Hicks announced that Billy deserved the mandatory sentence of life in prison without the chance of parole, and an additional consecutive maximum sentence of 15 to 30 years for the conspiracy charge. September 8, 2005 was sentencing day for Nicole. Three of Gene's closest family and friends were set to address Nicole. Chris was still having a hard time. He felt that the 35 years that Nicole had signed a deal for was just a fraction of the time that she deserved. The only reason she had escaped a life sentence was because she was willing to save herself. Chris didn't feel like it had anything to do with setting the record straight or helping the course of justice for her mother. It was done all for Nicole. Chris stood before Nicole with tears in his eyes and spoke directly of the crimes he had committed and what she had robbed from everyone else. He presented photos of Jean and her many accomplishments. Nicole openly wept. At times, she held her head in her hands, and tears flowed down her cheeks as she stared at the floor. Nicole's stepsister, Amy Kaczynskis, also spoke. At the end of her statement, she told Nicole that she loves her, but she may never forgive her and that she had lost her opportunity to have hope for her. Nicole's father, Anthony, also spoke. Although he wasn't scheduled to, he asked the court for permission. His words to Nicole were, quote, Life is full of choices. You changed a lot of people's lives. Everything that everybody has said in this courtroom. Think about it. You have plenty of time. Nicole was sentenced to 35 years, with a few years to be shaved off if she completed school and took college courses. Okay, so on a personal note, I had a couple of serious boyfriends in high school, and I was convinced that both were the love of my life. That's pretty laughable to me now as an adult, but at the time, I had never felt anything like I'd felt when I was with them. I feel like I was a lot like Nicole in that way. I made my entire life revolve around this one person while I was with them. And maybe that's common with teenage girls. I can only really speak from my own experience. But I do know that it is something that I tried to avoid the older I got. Uh, I tried to make sure that I was incorporating more than this one person in my life and had a fully rounded group of people that I hung out with and trusted. But no matter how strong my feelings for these guys were at the time, no matter how much, I just knew my parents were trying to ruin my life and hated me for not letting me spend every second of every day with them. I never, ever thought to myself, oh, well, I should just kill them. Life would be so much easier. There's a lot of stigma with mental illness and those who commit crimes. But as it was said in this case by a judge, mental illness does not make you insane. I myself, I, I live with mental illness. And I think it actually helps me to 
try to better understand some of these criminals sometimes. I don't ever think that there is a good reason or an excuse for murder, except maybe on self-defense. And I've never had a murderous thought, aside from the occasional, ugh, I just want to kill them, out of frustration. I am not a violent or even confrontational person. So the inner workings of the mind of someone who is capable of such crimes is pretty amazing to me. Anyway, that's all I have for the case of Nicole Kaczynskis and Billy Sullivan and the murder of Jean Domenico. What are your thoughts? We can talk about it on Twitter. You can find me at Fatal Podcast, or I also have a discussion group on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash groups slash Fatal Pod. Thank you all so much for hanging out and listening to the podcast. I really appreciate it. We've reached now over 17,000 downloads, and I never would have imagined that without you guys, it would not be possible. So thank you so much. And... I will get my next episode up just as soon as I'm done with it. Until then, stay smart, stay safe, stay out of the ground. (laughs) Bye, guys.